All right, shall we open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. Matthew 5, 27. As we continue on Sunday mornings through this Sermon on the Mount that takes up these three chapters in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and in which Jesus really seeks to begin to, de- uh, to declare to the disciples, the ones that have decided he's worth following, that, that a relationship with God by faith is, is far greater and more glorious. It's God's intention, but it runs square into and, 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 and it finds great opposition from the way that the world lives with their religious ways. And, and he gave this, this sermon to them in the second year of his public ministry when the crowds were huge, but so was the religious opposition, especially from the scribes and the Pharisees who not only had been misteaching the scriptures, but had been sometimes eliminating them altogether. <clears throat> and so after speaking to them about the Beatitudes, the relationship that God wants to have with men, the Lord turns to this issue of, of the law and of works versus being saved by grace through faith. And, and he does so in, in very clear terms, wonderful way to, to teach. The Lord takes what they taught and said, but look, let me just tell you. And he uses this great authority, I say to you. And six different times here in chapter five, he takes the teaching of the law by the religious man, and and, and literally uses it to say, there's more to it than outward obedience. The only righteousness God ever accepts is a pure heart. And and everything that that, that comes out, or or whether you can hide it, unless the heart is pure, then then the judgment of God will fall. So you can clean up your act. You can not swear. You know, you can count to ten. You can not blow your stack. But if it's in the heart, it's before the Lord. And so he uses these teachings of the Pharisees who, who basically reduced the law of God, especially the, the Ten Commandments, to behavior and says it has everything to do with intent, which is exactly what we've been looking at. God's interested in the heart. When, when Samuel was sent off to go anoint a replacement for Saul, <clears throat> the Lord said to, to Samuel, now look, when you go, don't look at the appearance of the one I'm sending you to, or, or don't look at the height of his stature because Those are the folks I've refused. The Lord doesn't see as man sees. Man, he looks at the outward. God looks at the heart. And that's really why Jesus came, to give men new hearts. And in all of these examples, the Lord will give us the teachings of the Pharisees, which are easily, I think, disprovable, if you will, or just negated. There's no way in the world anyone could believe that that was sufficient with God. He will then speak about the desire that drives them, which is where sin is found. And in every case, speak to the believer about how he can be delivered. So it's always deed, desire, and deliverance. Those are the three Ds, if you will, in all of these six examples. Now, we started last week with, uh, Jesus took the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And he said, um, you know, here's what they teach. But look, God's intention when he speaks to you about murder was to speak to you about what drives that, not just the overt act, but the issues of the heart. Hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness, selfishness, those reside in everyone's heart, and You know, thou shalt not murder, you might go, I'm off the hook. Thou shalt not hate someone, yeah, I guess I'm on the hook again. You know, thou shalt not be bitter, oh, that's me. Thou shalt not be unforgiving, okay, I get it. I need a new heart. And that's the intent. And and, and certainly the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees are ludicrous. But, But the Lord's intention and God's intention for the law is absolutely vital because people see sin dwelling in their hearts, they're going to see the need for the Lord. And God alone can give you a new heart, that's the issue. And even with a new heart, you still battle the flesh. So now you've got to put on the Lord, right? And put off the flesh. This morning in our second illustration that Jesus uses to clearly denote uh, the, the foolishness of the teaching, he turns to the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's the next verse in Exodus 20, I think it's verse 14. And he focuses again on the deed, on the desire, and on the deliverance. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, following the same formula, they say, I say, I love the Lord's, you know, authority by which he spoke. If the sixth commandment protected the sanctity of life, the seventh one protects the sanctity of marriage. And those who rely on outward observance, and that's all they're interested in, they break both of these. Because there's anger in the heart of man, there's certainly lust in every heart. It is, uh, it is such an obvious sin that 
you know, to try to deny it or somehow to say, well, you know, I've been faithful to my wife for 30 years. And you go, yeah, but what are you watching there on the TV? You know, what's in the magazine rack there next to your chair? Oh, that's different. It's not different. It's sin. And lust is lust is lust, no matter where you find it. You can certainly look in our culture today, and, and we have become a very permissive and perverse kind of society in, 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 in the sense that, you know, uh, sexual fidelity and marriage are things that people actually look down their noses at. That's not hip. That's not cool. That's not today. It, it should be, but it isn't. And, and, and our, our divorce rates over the last 15 years have hovered right around 50 to 52 percent. Now, I don't think anyone gets married and says, you know, I can't wait to cheat on her. It doesn't work that way. Everyone goes in thinking they're going to make it, but then that lust of the flesh, that lust that dwells in the heart of men, that, 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 that selfishness and that immorality that, that sin brings, um, begins to take a toll. And so Jesus says, I know these guys say to you, don't commit adultery, but even a lustful look, a lustful desire, a lustful longing, in God's eyes, is sin. There's really no way to separate the two. You might say, well, the action seems worse. Really? Not to the Lord. Not to him. To him, it is the same issue. It's a, an issue of sin. Back in 1998 and 1999, USA Today did a poll of males in the workplace, and they found that of the 14,000 people they interviewed, nearly 25% of, of adult males had cheated on their wives. And 60% of those were with coworkers. So if you add opportunity to sin, it's real dangerous. You know, life can get real difficult for folks, especially in a society that seems to, to smile. I, I saw a, in a magazine last week, uh, as I was working on the study of all things, a uh, barely clad woman, I'm try to put this right, sitting on a John Deere tractor to sell a tractor. And I went, really? Now, if the tractor doesn't sell you, Last year, Americans spent $10 billion on pornography, which is about the same amount of money that Americans spent going to baseball games and football games. So it is another sport, apparently. It's just a hidden one, one that we don't talk about so much. Can you imagine that that would be an equivalency of expenses? Why? Because sex sells. It sells, it appeals to the flesh, it appeals to men's hearts apart from God. It should, from Jesus' standpoint, fully expose our wickedness. Just to be able to convince every man, look, you can't clean up your act. Well, I've never slept with anyone else but my wife. Yeah, but look, at if you had an opportunity, if there was no consequence, if anyone cared about you, to look at you, then, then, well, all right, then maybe. Well, that's right, because that's where sin dwells. It dwells in the heart. I, I thought about, I was actually watching a, a bunch of TV programs this week, try, trying, to, trying to just flip back and forth and think, you know, if, if, if this was applied to this show, this show would go off the air. I mean, there's most, I, most, I hate to generalize, but there's an awful lot of TV shows that depend upon sexual perversion for, for comedy and unfaithfulness and, and sexual escapades and, and, and on and on it goes. And, and the attitude, unfortunately, of most people is, you know, they, they, they deplore the action, but they approve the intent. They hate the behavior, but they allow the desire. And we write them off. It's the good old boys. It's the high five. Hey, did you see her? Did you take a look at that? Did you see this? Have you taken it? I, I got to go home to my wife. Because sin dwells in the hearts of men. If you had a chance to sit in our offices here over the last 20 or 30 years, you wouldn't begin to believe the amount of destruction that lust brings to homes. That, that unfaithfulness and the, and the breaking of trust and the, and the horror that follows uh, unfaithful marriages and unfaithful men and women in marriages. You know, what began as a flirtation that, oh, it was just so innocent, ends up ruining their lives and the lives of everyone around them. And it's not a new problem. You know, Jesus was able to use it clearly as an example with the scribes and Pharisees and says, here's what they say. Are you kidding me? Well, here's what I say. You go to the, the, the church at Corinth, you know, the Cor Corinthian church w was in a terrible position. It was in a, it was in a very um, perverse city, you know. They had actually developed a term to Corinthianize meant to act like a Corinthian. It was horrible. So when, when Paul wrote to them, he, he had to say to them, look, food is for your stomach and your stomach is for food, but your body is not for sexual immorality. It's for the Lord. 
They had written off sexual escapades as just that, physical behavior, have, having no kind of spiritual consequence. And then Paul said in chapter 6, look, don't you know that, that your bodies belong to God, but if you join it to a harlot, now you're one with a harlot. How are you going to involve God in that? So you've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. And Paul spent a whole chapter of 7 of 1 Corinthians talking about marriage and adultery and divorce and, and the effects that it all has. It's a horrible issue, but it can't be swept away by just the, the rules that so often religious people use, which is, hey, I haven't done that. And the Lord said, well, of course you've done that. You've lusted. Every man has lust. If you look with lust. Throughout history, Christians have unfortunately reacted very you know, sometimes overreacted to this whole thing, forbidding folks to get married or, you know, worse, you know, putting them in convents. And the, 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 the early church father, Origen, who was born about 185 or so A.D., lived for, I think he lived about 65 years. He was a, he was a early church, you know, father. He, he writes a lot. You can find a lot of his writings. He was so appalled at the lust he found in his, in his own life that he had himself castrated. It was good intent, I suspect. But you know, if the problem isn't external, the solution can't be external. That's, that's a foolish uh, approach. Job, I think, understood that. He, he said in chapter 31, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, may she go serve someone else. If I haven't been faithful, if it's my heart that is being pulled away. The Mosaic Law, as, you, as Jesus quotes it here, portrays adultery as one of the more heinous uh, sins despicable to the Lord. It was punishable by death. You won't find too many things punishable by death, but that's one of them. So, you know, God's heart on the thing is that it, it's not something you want to involve yourself with. And yet, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were absolutely right. And they said it was adultery, she was sin. But what they failed to do was to see that sexual immorality is the same kind of sin. And that's what you find throughout the scripture. So the, the deed was adultery, but the desire that Jesus talks about in verse 28 was the issue. Now, I suspect, and I don't know, but I suspect that those men and women sitting around Jesus when he gave this sermon, when he said to them, look, it's not just adultery. If you just look with lust, that everyone would have looked at each other like, he's got to be kidding. I don't know what the reaction was of the individual because it sets before us an impossible task. There is no way you can not be lustful. Any more than there's no way you can not be angry. It happens. It's part of the makeup of sinfulness that man is born with. He's born as a sinner. The only hope we have is of a new heart and then the strength of God's spirit to turn away from the desires of the flesh. So, so for us to, 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 to hear Jesus say, if you've just looked with lust, you go, oh. Now here it's immorality. Here it's sexual immorality. It's, it's purely on that physical level. But the Bible uses that word lust to talk about, you know, things that people own, things that people have, things that you want that you, should, that you won't get. And it's the same word and it's the same sin. Here it just focuses specifically on the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the Lord says, if you look with lust. Ask anyone involved in an adulterous relationship, and I guarantee you, if they're honest with you, they're going to tell you that it started what they said innocently enough. A look led to a word, led to a suggestion, led to entertaining the thought. And then there hasn't... I, I, I've been pastoring 31 years, counseling marriages 31 years. I don't know one person that has ever said to me it was worth it. Not one. Forbidden fruit tends to be very, you know, uh, regrettable. It doesn't bless. Why? Because God says so. There's no benefit. Now, here in verse 28, the Lord uses the word look. And, and the Greek word means to examine with intent or to gaze with the mind's eye, mental observation that is determined and it's willful and it's prolonged. This is not some casual glance. Oh, probably shouldn't have seen that. We were in, in, in Holland years ago with a team from the church, and I was born in Holland. So we were helping plant a Calvary Chapel, and I said, so we're having a concert. I said, well, we should go down to the beach and hand out flyers, forgetting that I was in Holland. <laughs> so we got to the border, we're like, yeah, probably the beach isn't a good place to go, because a lot of people don't wear bathing suits at the beach. They leave them at home, apparently. So we went downtown. <laughs> well, it was embarrassing. You know, I had a bunch of, you know, 20-something kids with us. I, we just need to get out of there. That's, not tempta that's temptation that you just turn away from very quickly. That's not what this word means. This word means you see something you want, you, you determine to stay there, you go to the movie because of the contents, you go to the beach to look at the girls, you watch the TV program for its subject matters, you, you turn on a website for your pleasure. That's what this verse is talking about. That's the kind of lust that God says is sin. And, and, and we'll, we'll put you across the line 
of adultery in God's eyes. And you add the word lust, which, which means the unlawful desire for something God hasn't granted you. It, it means the, the, the will to have something you shouldn't have. And then you stay there wanting it and longing for it. That's the kind of lust that, that man finds in his own life that leads him into sin. And in the world, it's just the obvious, isn't it? I mean, you just look at the way the world's going when it comes to the promiscuity and the, and the liberal approach and outlook to those kind of things. And it's just, that's life in the world. If you're not up with it, you're, 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 you're old-fashioned. You're way behind. Get with the times. When David, in his spring of that year that he was almost finished overthrowing, really, those that opposed him, but when spring came and the wars started, because no one fought in the winter, it's still like that, by the way, in Iran, Afghanistan, everything calms down in the winter. Now it's, you know, it heats up when the spring comes. But in, in any event, David decided to send Joab and all of his friends out, you know, go fight the Ammonites, take care of this city. I'm going to stay here. And for the first time in his life, David didn't maintain the battle. And one night as he sat up upon his bed, he, he got up and he walked out on the porch of his house or out on the patio and he looked down and there was a woman there taking a bath. But, but you read there, David, David saw the woman and the word means he saw the woman. He stayed in his place. She was beautiful and then he uses the word to behold. He stayed a long time. He inquired of her. They told her that she was married to a man named... Uh, uh, What's his name? What is it? Very good. I blanked. He was a Hittite, right? Thank you very much. We'll just cut this right out of the tape. And then it says, he took her and he lay with her and then he sent her home. It took a lot of effort for him to, to stay there, develop his, his desires and his wishes and his wants to overlook the fact that she was a married woman, to use his power and his authority to have his way, to demand that she show up, to, to use her for his own pleasure, and then to, just to kind of summarily dismiss her, and then later to kill her husband, Uriah, <laughs> so that he could cover his sin. It's a terrible, terrible practice, but you see, that's the look. That's the willingness to stay in place. Jesus isn't speaking about some unavoidable or unexpected exposure to temptation. This is a sin that lingers in the heart, that where you sow the thoughts and the thoughts develop the action. When James was writing about sin and temptation, he said, you're blessed when you endure temptation because when you get through it, you become an approved man who receives a crown of life from the Lord who promises that to all who love him. But then James goes on to explain how sin and lust works. He says, let no one when he is tempted say God has tempted him. God cannot be tempted by evil. He doesn't tempt anyone with evil. Each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and he's enticed. Then when that desire conceives, it gives forth birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, then leads or brings forth death. So, you know, Satan might like to stumble us, but it is our decisions and our response from the heart to, to temptation that leads to sin. Can't blame God. A lot of people try. I, I, I'm amazed at how many people just come in and they, you know, I tried to handle it. It was just too much for me. It's kind of like it's not really my fault. I did my best. Really, God put me in the situation, you know. Or, or they'll say something like, if God didn't want me to fall, then why did he give me those desires? Yeah, you're right. It's God's fault. It's not you. It's his fault. And you think that that's way off, you know. Aaron gets caught with worshiping a, a, you know, a golden calf, and, and, and Moses said, what in the world are you doing? And he says this, well, I threw in the gold and out came the calf. <laughs> it really wasn't me, it was a miracle, you know. Adam and Eve get caught in the garden in sin, and the Lord said, what are you doing? And Adam says, well, that woman that you gave to me. Saul gets caught being a priest when he shouldn't have been. He's supposed to wait for Samuel. And he says to Samuel, he shows up, well, the people were so upset and I, you weren't here, so I just felt compelled. It's always someone else's fault. God didn't want me to cheat on my wife. Why did he make that woman start working in our office? She's beautiful. Yeah. It is our lust that entices us. And note that the response comes from within. It's the lust that entices us us. And only in Christ will we have victory. Paul was able to say to the Romans, you know, you're dead to sin. 
You're alive to God in Christ. So don't, don't any longer let sin, sin reign in your mortal bodies, obeying its lusts and all. Just present your member as, a, as a, you know, a, a, one that God can use for righteousness. Don't let sin have dominion over you anymore. But he can only say that to you as a Christian. He certainly can't say that to the world. To the world, he can just say, hey, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. So we might go, I need a savior. I need to be saved. I need to, to have the Lord save me. Now, James makes clear the word desire there is the same word as lust here. He is drawn away by his own desires. The word drawn away means to set a trap. The word enticed means to uh, bait a hook. Lust in your heart is a temptation that will be like baiting a hook or setting a trap, draw you to those things that you think will bless you only to find out that they'll destroy you and they are your response from the heart to the deception that you're being offered. Temptation becomes the lure. It wants to draw you away from God. It, it hides because it's bait in a trap, the bondage that's waiting for you. Oh, you're going to love this. You owe this to yourself. You've been, you've been a good man. You need, you need some happier days. I had a fella a couple of years ago who was leaving his wife for stupid reasons. And I said, well, that's stupid. Might as well not beat around the bush. You'll save yourself a lot of time. And, and he says this. He said this. The Lord shown me which woman I should have married. I made a mistake. God forgives mistakes. And then he says, doesn't God want me to be happy? But he was just convinced if he did all of those things against God's will, somehow he'd find happiness. That's bait. You're getting hooked, man. And promises of sin that the flesh can't deliver on, and, and now you're stuck. But notice that the desire leads to deception. The deception comes when you exercise your will by the lust that you have within and the bait that is held without. And so what desire has conceived, it brings forth sin. When desire is fulfilled, it brings forth behavior. But it starts with the desire. The desire which is nothing more than deception. It's been hooked and trapped and it is going to take you out. And the will approves the bait. And the lust desires and acts. And sin is born. And, and James goes on in chapter 1 verse 15 and says, look, when it is full grown, it will kill you. Well, it will kill you spiritually right away. It will cut you off from God as a believer. It will it'll hide God's goodness from you as an unbeliever. You'll just be more bound than ever before. It will take you out. But temptation isn't sin. You can say no you know, when the temptation comes. The question, you know, I sometimes hear from believers, and it's worrisome, is they want to know, is this sin? And then they'll tell you what they're doing. Is this sin? And you're supposed to be the arbiter of what is and what isn't. And so they'll say, well, I've never, I haven't slept with her, but I got to second base. And I'm saying, and so I said this, what has that got to do with baseball? I said, oh. <laughs> and they want to tell you, well, we've done these things. Look, dude, why do you want to know where the line is? Get as far away from the line as possible. Get right in the center of the will of God. Don't play around the edges. That's not a good place to survive, you know. That's not a, a good place to hang out. That will hurt you. That will destroy you. Always the case. The work of Satan in this area of lust is always to take the good things of God and pervert them. There's nothing wrong with desiring to be with your girlfriend or boyfriend sexually. It would be horrible if that didn't exist for you. You know, couples that come in engaged and we do premarital counseling, they can't wait to get their hands on each other. Pretty much. They're always pretty excited, you know? And that's good. It's just, before they get married, the timing is from hell. What is good now becomes perverted. And the marriage bed that is undefiled now becomes defiled. And, and, and I always find it interesting that when couples come in to get married that have fallen into sexual sin, and we ask them, they will usually excuse it with this, well, we love each other. And so being a smart aleck, I usually say, all right, let me just get this straight. You, you love this woman enough to stumble her, to place her in a position where God will have to deal with her, to cut both of you guys off from the blessings of God and to rob yourself from the goodness that God has for you. That's the kind of love you have for her. Please don't love me. <laughs> and then they use, oh, pastor. 
if you look with lust. And unfortunately, even the church so often, you know, people are caught up, man, in sin and flesh and sexual immorality. Like the, like the Corinthians around the church. Well, then here's Jesus' counsel for deliverance. The, the deed in verse 27, the desire in verse 28, and now here's the deliverance in verse 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Cast it from you. It's far more profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and your whole body should be cast into Gehenna, hell, the final place of the devil and his angels. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you. It's far more profitable for you that your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, in, in every one of these examples of their teaching God's intention and then the Lord has instruction for his own, here's, here's Jesus' instruction to his own on how they can have a pure heart because it is a heart issue. Now, you might say in reading this, well, wait a minute, if it's a heart issue, how is this going to help? You know, this seems pretty radical. And I would say to you, Jesus in, in no place offers physical solutions for spiritual problems. You won't find that in the Bible. In fact, I would like if there were physical solutions for spiritual problems. If you could have surgery on lust, wouldn't you have that surgery? Most of you teenagers should. And you young men, and, and you old men as well. You should have surgery. It'd be nice. They, they used to have, you know, these guys that would come around and they want to cast the demon of lust out of you. And I thought, that would be awesome. Cast that sucker out, man, then I'm good, you know? This would be great. But it's a heart problem. It's not a demon problem. You're the demon. It dwells within you. So that's not Jesus' solution here. It would be great. And even a person without an eye or without a hand or without a foot is still as capable of lust as someone who has all of them intact. You know, but when you speak with hyperbole, and the Lord uses it several different times, it is always meant to shock you and stop you in your tracks and look at what he is saying from a radical perspective. And I think this is what the Lord is giving us advice to do, and that is there is nothing so valuable that it is worth preserving at the expense of your right standing with God. In other words, whatever it takes to be sure you're right with God, make sure you set aside those things that keep you from those things no matter what the cost to you is, because there's no benefit in giving up your relationship with God for something that draws you away from him. Jesus literally says, sever yourself from that which stumbles you. The word scandalon is a word that means to stumble. Whatever traps you, trips you up. In other words, don't look. Don't flirt. Don't hang around those things. You know, control where you go and what you see and what you do so that what you can't control, you can then later discard without any hesitation at all. Control your environment. Be, be the guy that's going to be in a place where stumbling isn't an issue. It's not going to be a temptation. You're not going to expose yourself. We sometimes have folks who come out of real bad drinking, alcoholic backgrounds get saved. And then because they, they, they realize how difficult that life is, they want to go back to bars and share with people. And I always discourage them. Look, dude, God got you out of there. That's probably not your best place. Do you have a problem eating like bagels? No. All right, we're going to send you to Dunkin' Donuts to witness, and we'll get a Dunkin' Donuts guy who's eating way too much, a little bigger than he should be, and we'll send him to the bar. You know, that's, that's the idea here. Don't put yourself in a position to fail. Now, Jesus isn't suggesting self-mutilation, but rather, you know, self-evaluation. That, that, that decides that no matter what it takes, I'm going to stay away from those things that will stumble me or fail. Feed my flesh in the area of lust. Now, look, staying away from harmful influences and occasions for stumbling can't make your heart pure. But this is advice to those of pure hearts, those that have been saved. Once God moves in, he gives you strength, a new heart, a new desire. Things change within. I want to do what God says. I want to please him. Now when my flesh is, is, is given opportunity, it's still going to try to run and stumble me. So here's the Lord's advice. Stay away from those things at all costs. That's what these two verses say. At all costs. What, what your eyes look at, that's your decision. What your hands handle, that's your decision. Where your feet take you, what you'll allow in your thoughts, that's on you. Verse 28 is an impossible uh, or verse 28 is an impossible injunction. But with the Lord's help, I can find victory in him, right? And so can all of us. And that's the issue. The Lord's remedy for a wicked heart is a new heart. And his, his answer for helplessness is his sufficiency. 
Anything that leads you to offending God and are landmarks on the way to hell, get off that road. Or you can't take half measures dealing with temptation. Well, I can take it or leave it. No, leave it. I can take it or leave it. It won't work with sin. Just leave it. You don't want any part of it. If you're going to be his disciples, you're going to diligently pursue his ways. The, the greatest need that you have is a diligent commitment that will fight the good fight and put on the new man. And so uh, do whatever it takes. That's what the Lord says here in these two verses. Guard your eyes. You know, when, when Mrs. Potiphar grabbed Joseph and, you know, he, she, she hit on him and she said finally to him as she long, longingly looked to him there in Genesis 39, she, she grabbed him and she says, sleep with me or lie with me. And he, all he had on was his robe. And she had a hold of his robe and he slipped out of the robe naked, ran out at the door. No! Way to go, Joseph. Whatever it takes. You know, the guy that says to me, yeah, we fell into sexual sin. When was that? At three in the morning, parked by ourselves in the middle of nowhere. Really, you idiot. No wonder you have a problem. So I said to the girl, next time he parks, get out and walk home. Call your dad. Drink a call. You got a cell phone. Call. Run. Samson, every time you read of Samson, he was looking for some girl he didn't need in a town he shouldn't have been in. Judges 16, and he went down to, I forget what it is, Gaza, I think, and she found, he found a harlot there, and he stayed with her. And his parents would, don't you have, can't you fall in love with a woman from the, from the children of God? You know, no, and off he'd go. He made the choices that destroyed his life. Or David staying at home when he should have been out and battling. Jo Job did really good. He, he wrote in chapter 31, verse 1, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon a young woman. He made a deal with himself. That's what the, God's advice is to us as believers. You, you can overcome, unless you can't deny it's there, but you can overcome it by a new heart, the power of his spirit, and some determination to, to at all costs, verse 29 and 30, make sure it doesn't overwhelm you. Because what you see will fill your mind, and what, you, what you, fills your mind is what you long for. So why give it a chance to grow? Even Jezebel, you know, she understood that she, when Jehu was coming into town and she needed a relationship with him for some political reasons, and she wasn't past, you know, using physical means for political gain. You read there in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, when she heard he was coming to town, she painted herself all up. I think that's the words that were used. She sat in the window. Hey, baby, how you doing? <laughs> nod, nod, wink, wink. How's it going? Jezebel here. Want to come up and see me? Old is the world. And the Lord marked her ways. So be careful what you look at. Be careful what you see. You know, if they offend you, get rid of them. Some of you can watch TV. Others of you should not be watching it at all. Get rid of the cable. I have about six young guys across the country, pastors, who, um, in their determination to be accountable, have signed up on a website that monitors the, the um, websites that they go to every click on their Internet. And then I get the report. But they just want me to keep an eye on them. They're 20-something guys. They're newly married, young guys in the church. They just want to do the right thing. I admire them very much. I've never actually gotten anything in the mail to have to call me. Hey, dude, seriously? What is this right here, you know? Not one. But they, they're determined to do the right thing. They admit that there could be danger, and they don't want danger, you know? Whenever I traveled all of my years as a pastor, even when I first started, I always took my wife with me. Just a good idea, you know? Be smart guy. Don't, don't, don't put yourself in a position to fall. In fact, you put to death those things. And Jesus says here, it's better to go into eternity having missed out on some things that you think you should have had than to show up there with all you thought you should have had and you find out what you don't have is the one thing you need, a pure heart. And Grandy Stonehill saying, uh, shut the door, keep out the devil. So shut the door, keep out the devil. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you this morning that there are certainly places our feet can take us that we have no business being and things our hands can lay hold of or our eyes can gaze upon that, that will do nothing more than inflame our flesh. And yet, Lord, you say to us this morning, extreme measures may be necessary to keep us from a place of stumbling. So may you help us this morning, not only to realize what the main lesson is, that there's no way that, that sin can be limited to external behavior because every sin begins where it originates, where it sources in the heart. And we are sinners and sinful men and women, and we are certainly prone to lust as we are to anger. But it can destroy our lives. 
And Lord, we thank you for the new life you've given us and the new heart and the, and the warning to, to guard our hearts, to guard our eyes, to keep a guard. Maybe this morning you find yourself in church as a Christian, but you've got real sexual problems. You're, you're pornography driven, you're involved in an illicit affair, you're, you're thinking about it or it, you know, you, you've excused your behavior, but you know what you're doing is absolutely wrong. And let me just be the first to tell you, you're on your way to a disaster. It, it's going to harm you. It's going to destroy that which matters to you, as well as cutting you off from the God that you say that you love and want to serve. It, it is better earlier rather than later to stop and to return to the Lord and, and put it away. Those of you that aren't married and are in sexually active relationships, stop. Stop. It's hard to stop. It's certainly hard to stop. Hell is no good either. It's no place for you to be heading towards. Stop. And let the Lord be the Lord and follow His ways. And allow Him to be the one that you honor with your body, with your life. There's plenty of opportunity in, the, in our culture, in our society, to fall. It is acceptable, it is routine, it is admired, it is, it is joked about. It's no big thing, no big deal. But if you're interested in serving the Lord, it matters greatly to Him. May He deliver you. May you repent and turn from that wicked way and be holy as he is holy. We'd love to pray with you. If you want to talk to a pastor, grab a guy, sit down in the pews. You're welcome. Please, don't put it off. May the alarm bells ring and may your heart be made right. Shall we stand?